if a legislator from the Kenyan parliament asked a faculty member at the University of Kenya, or if a Kansas legislator asked a, um, a faculty member, new one, at the University of Kansas, uh, why should the people of Kansas, why should the people of Kenya uh, be paying, oh, I don't know, $200,000 for your research and your work? We get an answer from them, but it's not a very good answer, typically. It's an academic answer we get. They're not speaking the language of the politician. They're not they can't give that, that 30 second elevator speech, as we call it. You're in an elevator, you have 30 seconds to talk to somebody of importance about why the work is important and what kind of policy should it lead to and what are the implications. They're, we're not good at that. We don't teach that. We teach them how to be good scientists. We don't teach them how to be good translators from science to policy. There are exceptions. Some universities have taken uh, the bull by the horns and, and are actively training students and establishing offices in that transition from research to policy, through implications to policy. And notably, Arizona State University, uh, Columbia University, University of Oregon, and a few others. Other hurdles. Chris, can I ask a question? Please. On your previous slide. So you said there are some institutions that are making the connection. Yes. Within what degree you can be? Within the science degree? Within the science degree, do they actually make the connections? Is it an interdisciplinary? Yes. Um, so, for example, at Arizona State, their president, Michael Crow, has attempted to tear down the individual departments and instead create functional schools like a school for the environment in which you combine the best science, law, economics and so forth and, and political science as well as communication uh, so that um, uh, there is this integration that you're not just doing the science in a vacuum, but you're doing the science in a real world that is being seen by the public, by politicians, by legislators who need to be informed about this because after all, it's their taxpayers are paying for this. So uh, what is the best way to um, uh, translate this science into uh, the kind of meaning that politicians and legislators and the public will understand and will grasp. It's as a win-win. It can give rise to um, really well-informed policy. It also gives back to the people the knowledge that they have paid for with their tax dollars, it instead of just being published in academic journals that five people read. And I think it also ensures the communication components of someone actually being able to translate the work that they're doing to policy makers. Correct, correct. I yes, sir. I don't think that um, that you really need to set up all these institutional operations to do it. You, as individual PhD supervisor, can make do all sorts of things. So um, I I encourage my students to give talks at the local bird clubs, so they are in a sense learning to communicate their science to the uh, to the public. We have a uh, relationship with a chap the name of Tim Neary, who um, has a um, environmental program at the most user-hostile day or time of the week, six o'clock on Sunday morning. That's when the radio stations will give conservation a slot. But um, you know, I, I know it's, it's kind of compulsory, but I try and give all my students at some point to be uh, phoned up by him and they are talking to the nation on their cell phone. It's quite a challenge. Yes, it is. Uh, so you're an exception because uh, most, uh, and I'm not being disparaging here, it's just how they're trained, most university mentors 
uh, most of the professors who are training, uh, under whose tutelage uh, graduates are being trained, uh, can themselves not translate their science well for legislators or the public. So they can't really do it for students. And, and the Biodiversity Institute at, at KU is as guilty as any other one. Um, uh, and we have the ability to, to change that, and, and I hope we will. It is ironic, say, that of all the 65 grad students that are uh, uh, studying in the Biodiversity Institute at the University of Kansas, Kate here is probably getting the best education in science policy and the real world of biodiversity politics by being uh, on this uh, project. So, um, so last week, uh, uh, Tim Leary also has a thing called this, the Sappy Nature Journal in 60 Minutes, which is uh, 8 to 9 on Saturday mornings, and that's a pre-recorded program. And so the kids who weren't comfortable just being talking to the nation off the cuff, I got them all to be interviewed by him because he came to Cape Town last week. There were three students, all of whom said, before they went to talk to Tim Leary, do I really have to do this? And uh, one of them bounced up to me afterwards and said, that was fun. I'll do it again. Great. And another one said, um, no, she wasn't terribly happy with it, but I said to her, if you're in a group of, um, of people and the radio interviewer comes to you, your little group, and says, one of you must talk, will you do it? And she said, yes, yeah, she'd comfortably do it. So it's, it's just so important to get people over that barrier, right. actually. Uh, and I said, this is a line in your CV that makes you highly employable, you know? Right. Radio interview with Tim Deere. <laughs> Tim Deere. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most employers would grab some of you, actually, just is not scared when a camera right. or a microphone is put in front of their faces. So, for example, at Arizona State, uh, they um, established a new way of doing things in which uh, a social science unit led by two very, very smart individuals uh, went around to every single researcher that had a National Science Foundation research grant and talked to them about what's the meaning of your work? Have you thought about it? What are the social consequences? What are the what are its implications tomorrow, the next day, next month, next year? Uh, and at first they met with enormous resistance because researchers don't want to talk about that. They said, you know, get out of here. I need to do my work. But like a good virus, that started spreading until many of them, many of the researchers, that's now part and parcel of their thinking. And the National Science Foundation on its part is demanding in all of its research proposals um, a, a whole section called broader impacts. They have demanded that for a long time, but now it's really taken on a great deal of importance. Not only do you have to give the intellectual merit of your work, but you have to present what are the broader impacts of your work in terms of education, in terms of social consequences, in terms of uh, uh, affecting other disciplines and possibly even affecting policy. Gene. Yeah, I have a concern with regard to policy and science at national level. With such a huge ramification, is there any coordination uh, so to avoid duplication of research activities? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't think I got your question. Okay. John. Um, I, I realize that there is, uh, let's say, a very huge activity of research at yes. national level. Yes. Do you have a coordination? The coordination uh, center to regulate research activities such, uh, such as so that you avoid replication, duplication uh, of research activities? That's a great question. The question is um, um, for those who may not have heard, uh, Jean, um, there's a great deal of research that goes on at the national level in the United States. Is there a coordinating mechanism or a coordinating body? that makes sure that there's no duplication of the okay. research? Um, the answer is no. And uh, this is one of the things that is uh, certainly always being studied by the US government. There is a lot of duplication of research uh, among the different agencies. 
Um, it's not an exact duplication, but there certainly is a lot of, a lot of overlap in uh, research that's funded, say, by the Department of Energy, by the engineering division of, or directorate of the National Science Foundation. Uh, there's certainly a lot of overlap, say, in the Department of Education and the education section at NSF and so on and so on and so on. Um, I think the feeling is there's just too much to coordinate and there's no one body that can oversee all the research. There's a lot of statistics that are done, but uh, no, the, the short answer is no. There is no oversight that would ensure no duplication of research. And in many ways, the research often is complementary and not duplicative, and that is the research can be done at different scales, uh, or if it's biodiversity research, it's done on different taxa. Now, uh, could the research be a lot more uh, coordinated and integrated? Absolutely. Okay. What are the hurdles in outside the academic sphere to translating international science to international policy? We've talked a lot about multilateral facilities. We've had a lot of discussion around the table and, and town and, and uh, especially and Jorge have talked about the perils of uh, institutions such as IPES, CBD and many of the other acronyms. And you've heard a lot around the table about GBIP, which is actually, in my opinion, one of the most successful multilateral organizations. But what are the hurdles to multilateral organizations? Like CBD, IPES, GBIF, Diversitas, EOL, and so forth. How many facilities can countries fund? Town made that point. It's a, in many ways a zero-sum game. For example, I can imagine countries trying to decide, where do I give my money? They all mention biodiversity. They all mention ecosystem services. They all mention sustainability. They all mention conservation. Do we fund the CBD? Do we fund IPES? Do we fund GBIF? In a zero-sum game, and certainly when in an era of economic uh, instability, ministers are asking those questions. And to them, all three can look the same, even though they may have very different missions. So it is a zero-sum game. An increasing sea of acronyms seeking funds from a static or shrinking pool of resources. Not all of them can survive. What are the other hurdles of multilateral facilities? And this is a personal view from my own experience. But I think these would be echoed by both Town and Jorge. What are they good at? They're good at holding meetings. They're great at scheduling meetings, usually in the most expensive places on earth. Meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Talk, talk, talk. And talk is not cheap. This talk is expensive. They're fantastic. They're great at issuing white papers at the ends of every meeting. White paper after white paper after white paper. They're fantastic at issuing 10-year targets. CBD has a great record of issuing targets, never meeting them. By their own admission, they have never met one target. Or maybe they've met one or two. Maybe they've met one or two. So now we have the HE targets. But the HE targets are nothing more than a, a kind of a, re, a reformulation of the targets that weren't met in 2010. We have to be brutally honest. We have to admit that. Because if we're not brutally honest, we can't fix it. Great at talking, great at meetings, awful at actions. This has to be fixed. There is, of course, an incredibly important role for multilateral organizations to attack global problems. Not just in the environment, but in many other spheres. 
they have to learn to work better. So for example, as we all have said, the CBD has not met a target in 20 years. That's probably an exaggeration. They've met a few targets. And what the CBD has done well is that it's given the imprimatur of many countries to do their own biodiversity assessments and, and contribute to the CBD. That has been a, a really terrific accomplishment that many countries, whether they have signed or not, would never have done that. And I actually thank Vanderlei for pointing that out to me. What are some of the other hurdles of multilateral, multilateral facilities? Because all the countries are involved in a multilateral facility, they are forced to reach agreement by consensus. Everybody says consensus is wonderful. I don't think so. Consensus is not always wonderful. Yes, you have to have consensus sometimes. But consensus is often impossible because when you have 153 countries in a facility, contributing to facility, you're going to have conflicting priorities, conflicting agendas, conflicting cultures. So when you reach consensus that deal with all of these conflicts, the result can often be the lowest common denominator that everybody can live with which often means no action, or action that is so unimportant that it will not have much of an effect. So you issue a white paper. The lowest common denominator achieved through consensus is not progress. At least if that is the process, 